given that this is the uh, lecture that has the latest hour throughout the school, I'm really glad, glad, food, uh, glad to still see an audience. <laughs> um, I was actually in, initially puzzled because there was no slot after dinner. And then I realized that probably a coincidence that uh, if I had not come to this winter school at this very hour, I'm supposed to be lecturing in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe yeah. you're trying to get me into the Singapore yeah, time zone already. Yeah. It's not it's not a without coincidence, yes. That's right. <laughs> All planned. Or well, maybe it's a very, very long reach. Reach. <laughs> long for that time. It's a very long yeah. range plan. Yes. <laughs> maybe so, you should also have one before breakfast. <laughs> So right now, across the globe, uh, uh, Cole Atom uh, experimentalist is taking over my class and teaching the students about experiments in quantum information. Because I teach, the, I, I teach them all the theories and make them take for granted that qubits are easy to prepare. You just write them on the board. You just write a unitary on the board, and there you go. But uh, after this week, when I go back, and they will see me, and it's like, it's not so easy, maybe. <laughs> Some of my experimental colleagues think so too. It's a waste of energy. Um, have you shared with your class the, the, mm -hmm. the Zoom link? Because they could actually watch it. Oh, no. I, I haven't sent it to them. I will probably give it. Uh, so so the, the graduate yeah. class has uh, components of research seminars. So I may be giving a, a bridge version of this when I get back, maybe later in the semester. Well, they will appear on the uh, ITAN YouTube channel. So ah. you could actually share it. Even better. Cool. So, uh, I think we should then begin uh, without much further ado. Please. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I will also start the timer in case I go overboard. Um, so, let's keep time. <laughs> Sleep is a very important resource. <laughs> so, let's, let's, okay. So, we are taking off from where I left off yesterday. Um, so this is resource theoretic quantum thermodynamics two, lecture two. Um, and um, so we run a quick recap of what we talked about uh, yesterday. Um, this morning when I woke up, I saw a picture of me explaining this slide on social media with a quote. Um, I usually don't appear on social media, so this came a bit as a shock to me, but essentially um, we talked about how the quantities of free energy, which is so intuitive for, for the physicists, for the quantum thermodynamics, um, uh, and see how it really links to uh, the quantum relative entropy, which is again, something that is very close to the intuition of quantum information theorists. Uh, it's the quantity that tells us, tells us how well we can distinguish two different states from one another. So in a very quantitative way. Um, and after that, we started talking about what are the bare basics of uh, what constitutes a resource theory, uh, namely that you have to spell out the rules of the game of what is cheap and what is allowed for free. And within that framework, you ask, well, if I have resourceful states, how do I transform them to one another? Uh, and what about questions of rates, for example? And uh, to illustrate that, we looked into two of the earliest and most well-studied examples of resource theory. And one of them was of entanglement, which is uh, also known as the LODC theory. Um, and we saw for the first time majorization uh, as a way to compare probability vectors. And we also saw its relationship with entropy, right? So those are, those are some of the things we saw. Um, and we saw that majorization tells us uh, state transformation conditions under the LODC theory when we are in the special case of Alice and Bob sharing a pure bipartite state, right? Um, then we switched gears and we talked about um, a very uh, different type of resource theory, which uh, looks like uh, basically using randomness. So randomness is allowed to be used for free um, and also all unitary operations. Um, and you see this kind of uh, channels that attempt to kind of uh, model the effect of noise. Um, and we also see that uh, quite remar remarkably, you see that majorization again emerges, uh, this time for no special case, but 
actually for necessary and sufficient conditions for generic states to be transformed from one to another. And that was that was kind of the idea. Um, I put this slide, which is kind of very full and have many words here, just to recall to you that we kind of went through the proof sketch, which is going to be important for today because we will see essentially the same thing, but for some of the methods. <clears throat> so we had kind of three steps to kind of reduce the problem systematically from density matrices to conditions on the eigenvalue spectrum of density matrices and link these to uh, link the quantum noise operation to a classical stochastic, uh, in particular bi-stochastic channel, um, <clears throat> and used some mathematical theorems to give us the relationship between bi-stochastic processes versus majorization. So those were the three steps. Um, and finally, we kind of concluded with a picture of thermal operation, which is a resource theory or the bare basic resource theory when we think about uh, quantum thermodynamics, a system interacting with a bath uh, in a strictly energy preserving manner. And uh, if you are allowed to trace out then parts of the bus or the entire bus later, we want to see what happens to the system. How can we think about uh, state transition conditions uh, with such a resource theory? Okay, so that was what uh, we talked about yesterday. And immediately after yesterday's lecture, I got a question of, you know, um, what does noisy operations actually mean? Why do people want to study it? What, what, what is so interesting or so motivating about it? And the, the quick answer to this is that not only it intuitively already models the use of randomness, uh, but it's also actually a very special case of thermal operation in the case where your Hamiltonian of the system is fully degenerate. Okay, uh, we, we saw these kind of systems today uh, in the morning when Nicole was talking about uh, information uh, erasure uh, and uh, these things. And what we see here is that in some cases you have a system, let's say when you use them for quantum information processing, you use them as part of a circuit that you want to build, you don't necessarily care about the energy uh, in, in that basis that you use for computation. And in that case, um, you assign, if you are assigning the same energy value to your system in, in that basis, then you are essentially in the, in the case of noisy operations, and maybe you just care about uh, randomness and not necessarily a, a prior distribution that gives you some sort of energy, energy distribution. <clears throat> so noisy operations is actually a special case of thermal operation <clears throat> when energy uh, eigenvalues are no longer important. Um, <clears throat> and so the difference between them is really that in thermal operation, you have a prior distribution, that is characterized by your system Hamiltonian. And therefore, the unitaries that are allowed in that picture are further restricted. You have to obey strict energy preservation, whereas in noisy operations, you just don't care because all of them have the same energy. Um, so um, many of the things or the intuitions or the mathematical tools that we have for noisy operation, which is majorization essentially, can now then be generalized uh, to work for thermal operations um, with some terms and conditions. So the spoiler here is that you go from majorization to something called thermal majorization, which takes into account that prior energy distribution, but you lose something in the sense that it no longer is a sufficient monotone and it only retains uh, its necessity. Okay. So, um, and this kind of attempt of generalizing from noisy thermal operation also comes with it some of uh, the loss that we, uh, of nice properties that we had from noisy operation. Um, last, uh, yesterday we also talked about um, how in noisy operation, people can prove that you actually don't need a, a very large dimension, uh, uh, dimension of randomness. Uh, it just needs to be as large as the system if you're thinking about any state transition. But in fact, once you have thermal operations, this is no longer true. Uh, even for the single, uh, the case of a single qubit, uh, it has been proven that the dimension of the, the bus actually needs to be large if you want to perform uh, arbitrary state transitions. And, and that really comes from the further restriction of strict energy population that you have. Okay. Um, similarly, in noisy operations, we know this kind of decomposition 
of a huge, uh, let's say, bisocastic channel into steps of, well, uh, every time only dealing with two levels. And that's, that's kind of nice because it's breaking down a big complicated channel or unitary into just two steps, step of two, right? Um, and that's a very nice structure to have, but uh, decompositionality is not uh, true in general for thermal operations, which means that if you have a large uh, uh, thermal operation on a d-dimensional system, you cannot in general break it down into concatenation of two level thermal operations. Um, it also doesn't hold even if you allow for a general mixture of resistance. Okay, so we lose some 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 nice structure here. But one thing that we still do retain is that at least for state transition conditions when your, your states are uh, energy incoherent, we still have this very rigorous understanding of how thermal majorization as a single shot kind of transition condition, how does it converge as we increase the number of copies, how does it converge back to the uh, relative entropy, uh, which is a free energy essentially. So that's what we have. Now, we just, this may be a simple question, but mm -hmm. when you talk about the dimension of the thermal map, mm -hmm. I mean, the thermal map has in principle infinite degrees of freedom relative to your quantum system. So, what, do you mean something about physical scale, or what do you mean by dimension? The dimension of the field of the of the In some cases, yes. But in, in the risk of theoretic picture, um, when we spelled out the, the allowed operations, what we said was, well, you can take any Hamiltonian uh, of the bath you want. Uh, let's say in particular, you can take a finite dimensional one and you can use it as long as it's in the deep state, you can use it as a free state and you can perform your operations. You, so, so thermal op operations also capture the effect of finite bars, but uh, only using finite bars will not give you the full power of thermal operations. So in general, you do need large bars. Is a finite dimensional thermal band better called a reservoir or some type of maybe? Okay. Maybe. Yes. Is there still an equation for why this is this one? Yeah, and also is there like some maybe stuff, some family of operations which would they would call? I'm super glad you asked because this is essentially something that initially disappointed us. Um, because um, it, it seemed intuitive that you should be able to do it. Um, and in fact, you couldn't. And for some time, it wasn't so clear why you couldn't. Um, <clears throat> and we recently found out why. Um, and so I will talk about this on Friday. Yeah. More questions? Nope. Then I go on. Uh, so we will... Before we, we kind of begin with thermal majorization and all the technical details, I want to spell out one thing that we have already seen part of in uh, throughout these two days, um, which is that if we think about thermal operations, we can easily uh, pick out two very important features of these operations. Now, maybe we can take a moment here, in case everyone is already starting to fall asleep after dinner. We can take a moment here to say what are the basic qualities of thermal operations. Um, maybe some properties that they will nice properties that they will satisfy. Any any guesses? Any, any takes? Yes. Energy conservation. Energy conservation uh, on the global system definitely. This this is part of the definition, right? Um, but maybe think about something else that Maybe a hint is to think about what is the state that is a fixed point of thermal operations. Sorry? Yeah. yeah. So indeed, thermal operations, one of the main properties that they will easily satisfy is that they will definitely preserve the deep state. And this just comes from the fact that you're allowed to take deep states in and you're only allowed energy preserving uh preserving unitaries. And so they, they have to fulfill this quantity. Um, what else? Well, in some sense, the next one you have already seen as well at some point, so I will just show it. So um, 
thermal operations actually commute with time evolution. And this is again calling back to what Ronnie said in the, in the beginning of uh, yesterday as well. And, uh, in the fact that if you have a uh, time evolution um, and if you have um, a thermal operation here, then it doesn't matter which you apply first, um, they're going to commute. So these are two very nice properties that uh, thermal operations have. Um, and so much so that people have also think, well, maybe uh, we can, instead of studying thermal operation, uh, state transition conditions, just by using the definition of thermal operation, which we call, it's not, you, you call it not a very easy definition, right? Because you have to maybe think about optimizing all possible energy preserving operations and all possible bars that you can choose. It's not exactly easy to see how you would maybe extract state transition conditions out of it. But if you pick two uh, such essential kind of mathematical properties of thermal operations, then you might say, ah, maybe these uh, are in fact equivalent to thermal operations. Maybe we can get some nice conditions out of, out of them. And the answer to this is, Yes and no, in some sense, because on one hand, it's true that it's not true that uh, one and two uh, together imply that uh, E has to be a thermal operation. But on the other hand, if you are only concerned with state transition conditions where your final state is energy incoherent, then the, the description of, in fact, property one is enough to uh, dictate whether a thermal operation exists or not. And so on here, on, on, uh, on the question of if a state can go to another state via thermal operations, could involve in principle optimizing over bars and energies and all that. Uh, but in fact, it is precisely for, for the energy incoherent case, it's precisely related to what is the action on the energy population um, in a way such that that action on the energy population actually preserves the Gibbs population. So that is the, the connection between those two. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, at this point, what you have heard about is essentially about thermal operations. But before we continue on that, that route, I also want to say that thermal operations uh, has been, uh, I mean, critically viewed or think about well, how do we how do we make it more uh, uh, more all encompassing? How do we make it better or more realistic for for usage and all these things? So as a result, thermal operations uh, have been extended or uh, studied in different directions, um, and these are motivated by different considerations. So um, oops, um. On one hand, uh, there's a group of people who really are motivated by making it even more general and think about uh, the fact that, well, maybe with a more general set of uh, conditions, for example, not restricting to thermal operations, but just taking the bottom line idea that you should be preserving and you should be uh, uh, covariant in this respect to time transition, um, then maybe we will get a nice characterization for the state transition, which is all what we want, um, and maybe we'll also get like reversibility easily. Uh, so that's one group of people who, who would be motivated to study thermal operations in terms of that extension. Um, so um, we then talked about this enhanced version of thermal operations, which is basically taking the set of channels that satisfy these two conditions. Um, and earlier, there was also the study of just the first condition itself without thinking about uh, time translation covariance. Um, and these are nice. And in fact, we do know better state transition conditions if we relax to these larger sets of channels. But then the question is always, okay, but what is the physical meaning of this? I mean, these are just a set of channels that satisfy some very nice mathematical properties indeed, but you can't tell me that there's a particular bus or a particular physical operation that performs this, right? So um, the question is always in this direction, what is the physical operation, the process that allows us to achieve this larger set of operations? 
Now, um, of course, motivated by this more concrete process um, and also closer to, let's say, experimental realizations, then people also have start to look at, well, maybe summer operation is just allowing too much. They may be just allowing for uh, arbitrary unitaries across system and bus, and that involves really like being able to manipulate the microscape of, of the joint system, which is maybe too much. Um, so in that motivation, people also start, study subsets of this. Um, one of them is called elementary thermal operations. This was one of the first general uh, first uh, study of like subsets of thermal operations. And this is essentially the, the two level thermal op operations uh, concatenated that I was talking about just now. Um, this has a very clear kind of uh, physical picture in mind because most of what uh, is uh, some, uh, ele what most of elementary thermal operations can be seen as a result of James Cummings' interaction with a with, uh, bath. Okay. Um, and also, there is a second generalization, which is Markovian thermal processes, which says that essentially these are the processes that uh, obey such uh, uh, equation. Um, and these two sets don't, in general, overlap. Uh, they are only overlapping uh, when, uh, so Markovian thermal processes is contained in elementary thermal operations when you think about energy in coherent state transitions only. Otherwise, they are two different sets with some overlap, okay? Now, these are very well motivated in some sense, but the problem always comes with characterization. So now for these more realistic sets, you ask, if I have rho and rho prime, whether I can go from rho to rho prime, using these smaller sets, the <clears throat> characterization, how you compute these state transition conditions, is a bit more tricky. Uh, and that's kind of the, the, the uh, overall landscape or, or pictures of what happens when people try to generalize the operation. And um, of course, there are more. So I haven't even started talk, talking about catalysis. Later, I will talk about it a little bit. Um, we also have uh, generalizations where you have uh, the presence of other conserved charges uh, other than just uh, en energy itself. So this is um, also part of this larger picture of thinking about generalizations for some population. Okay. Can you restate when the Markovian thermal processes are outside the elementary? When what is the case in which they noted the larger? So you can think of these hierarchies as a statement on the set of channels. Okay. Um, in that case, all of them are different. If you think about the question of uh, not in terms of channels, but just in terms of if a state can go from row to row time via these operations, can I do it with, uh, let's say, uh, elementary of operations? So comparing only the state transition conditions, you can ask this question. And if you restrict further that your, uh, your initial or final state don't have energy coherence, then the state transition conditions for Markovian thermal processes are contained within the set of elementary thermal operations for, for energy incoherent states. Yeah. So similarly as for thermal operations and Gibbs preserving maps, they are a different set of, of channels. But if you already have an incoherent uh, uh, state, uh, energy incoherent state, and you are concerned just about state transition conditions, then whenever there's a thermal operation that does, uh, uh, whenever there's a Gibbs preserving net that does this, there's also a thermal operation that, that does the same thing. So this hierarchy will collapse when we talk about state transition conditions on energy incoherent states. Okay. Okay. So um, coming back again to the essential resource theoretic question, which is that given all the states, the, 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 the framework that you're working with, given the specifications of your system, meaning the Hamiltonian, uh, the initial state, and some target states that you have, and the temperature of the bath that you are working in, 
Then you have two questions. When is row to row prime possible? And the second question is what is the maximum rate, uh, which means taking many copies uh, and trying to achieve a certain kind of uh, rate of compression. So these are the two questions. And these questions, uh, uh, the answer to these questions are basically formulated in uh, several different quantities. So thermal majorization, we already talked a little bit about, we'll do it more. Um, generalized free energies is another one of them. Uh, and here you can't see it, but it's basically fine grain free energies. Um, they, were the, they were kind of independently developed, these two. Uh, and uh, we, we will see um, what, uh, why. So the kind of summary or spoiler, uh, because this is kind of halfway into the lecture, maybe, um, is that we have all these different ways of quantifying state tran uh, transition transition, and we can easily see uh, which of them lead to irreversibility and which of them do lead to reversibility. So there is just kind of a tab that allows you to, to keep track of that. Thermal majorization will lead to, in some sense, a sort of irreversibility. And this can be slowly uh, um, relaxed by allowing for catalysts and also by taking the ID limit, which is many copies. And in that limit, we know that uh, things go back to be reversible. Um, and for the other approach where we talk about fine grain free energies, uh, we see that this has been used to kind of derive a, a fluctuation theorem. Um, which you see irreversibility because you see that there are additional constraints on the work that you can extract. It's not necessarily that you can extract just equal work just equal to the free energy. Um, there are uh, there are restrictions on how you can, on how you, how well you can do that. Uh, in in the case of work being a stochastic random um, and surprisingly, you also see that some of these. Uh, Additional restrictions can later be bypassed with a cat uh, catalyst, leading to a certain sense of uh, reversibility, although partial. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's summary. Um, okay, so we come to thermal majorization. Now, um, in the case where bro, can you see this? But maybe I can try to move this. Uh, yeah. Um, sorry? Don't yeah, it's it's just that the the mouse is not uh, yeah, I don't see the, the mouse, so it's a bit tricky. Maybe I put it here. Ah okay. Hi video panel or but also hmm? height floating. This Better. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so in the special case where our final state, so we're not talking about the initial state yet, when the final state has no energetic coherence, then thermal majorization is necessary and sufficient. And this is usually denoted by um, the notation that we have for majorization with the beta here. Um, and uh, I'm not going through the definition yeah. itself because it's a technical definition, but essentially uh, on Monday we talked about how you can visualize majorization as drawing basically a cumulative probability function, drawing it in a way such that you order the eigenvalues so that it's, it's a, it's a con concave function like this, and you compare the two curves. And comparing the two curves tells you about majorization. Now, Thermal majorization is extremely similar with the only difference of here, instead of plotting just the first largest eigenvalue, second largest eigenvalue, et cetera, what you are plotting here is the Gibbs factors that correspond to that particular probability uh, cumulative. And so here you still have the probabilities uh, accumulated, um, but here you have the accumulated uh, uh, amounts of the Gibbs factors so e to the power of minus beta ei. Uh, and again, they are ordered, but they are ordered in such a way that the ratios are uh, um, decreasing so that you have this concave kind of function, essentially. So that is from the visualization of what thermal majorization means. And if you draw out the curves of, of two states, and one always lie above the other, 
then you say that raw temp thermal meteorization uh, of thermal meteorizers. Uh, okay, so this uh, procedure, of course, depends on the states and it depends also on the Hamiltonian, right? Um, and we can construct it very efficiently, uh, and this tells us already state transition conditions. And you notice that this is necessary and sufficient even if my initial state does have energy coherence. And the intuition here is actually coming from the fact that dephasing your state in the energy eigenvalues commutes with any thermal operation. Okay, so let's let's go through the the, the full sketch of this. So the first step is to think about suppose well you have rho prime uh, having no energetic coherence, but rho in general does have some coherence. Um, essentially, the first thing we note is that the energy dephasing map actually commutes with any thermal operation. And this means that without loss of generality, I can first apply the dephasing map to the initial state. I can kill off all the energy coherences and I can apply my thermal operation. This achieves the exact same uh, behavior of applying first the thermal operation, taking whatever is left that has some energy coherences, and then decohering later to the final state which has no energy coherence. Okay, so this is the first point. Um, and after uh, knowing that, well, in general, now we are in the case where both rho and rho prime are energy incoherent, so no coherences in the energy eigenbasis whatsoever. Now we have uh, to kind of relate again the problem of whether there exists a thermal operation that gives you the transition to a classical problem of whether there exists some classical channel that brings P to P prime. So an action on the energy population, okay? And the only condition that it has to satisfy really is that it uh, preserves the uh, probability distribution that gives you gives you the uh, that corresponds to the thermal state of the system. So, uh, uh, so here you have the Gibbs distribution, which is uh, basically a diagonal uh, a probability vector with all the all the Gibbs vectors, um, and this is preserved by what is called the Gibbs stochastic channel. Um, and the second step of the proof is to kind of uh, uh, have a one-to-one -one kind of relationship between the, the quantum problem of having a thermal operation versus the classical problem uh, of having a good stochastic channel. Now, here I have kind of skipped over some some proofs, um, but obviously you have to you have to do the, the two-way proof, and the converse is actually uh, still has some subtlety. Okay, so it's easier to say that if you assume that you have some thermal operation you can figure out what happens on the diagonals. But the tricky part is to say, if you know that there is some uh, Gibbs stochastic channel G, how do you design a thermal operation out of that? And there is some subtlety because you not necessarily always can reach it with uh, full precision. Um, you might need an infinite pass to do that. So uh, basically, if you, if you um, so basically what is said, uh, said here in the proof is that uh, in order to reach higher and higher position, you might in principle sometimes need a bigger or bigger pass. But that is the only, only subtlety. And the full proof is in ML, which is Matteo Lostaglio's uh, review, if you are interested. Yes. Previous slide. <coughs> Previous slide. Oops. Yes, so in that regard, hmm? uh, are we ordering by the PIs or some ratio of PI? Yeah, so we are ordering by the ratios. We are ordering such that PI uh, divided by its Gibbs factor is always decreasing so that you have this nice shape. Okay. More questions? No? Okay. Cool. <laughs> so uh, so that, that's the second step of your proof. And the third step is, again, to relate uh, the existence of the classical uh, uh, existence problem of the Gibbs stochastic channel to the mathematical condition of comparing thermal majorization curves. Um, so those are the main three steps that are involved in proving this uh, result. Um, so the question is, of course, 
what if now both rho and rho prime do have some coherence? So now you cannot ignore it. You cannot pretend that it's not there. And you really want to ask the question, well, how do my state transfer contributions change? Um, and what happens here is that we still have a necessary condition, which is in terms of thermal majorization. So here, I think this should be delta instead of T. Um, but essentially, you would have to apply the thermal majorization condition just on the diagonalized versions of uh, your initial and uh, final state. So you already kill off some of that, that information and you're still comparing the, the diagonals, uh, the energy population, and uh, they still have to satisfy this thermal majorization order. That is still a necessary condition, but fulfilling that tells you nothing about whether the transition is uh, possible or not, because there's still co co coherence that you have to deal with. Um, <clears throat> so the proof catch of this is also quite simple. Um, since they are decohered, you can write them in terms of just the probabilities and the energy eigenbasis. So I just write I here, because you can always take your computational basis to be your preferred basis. Um, <clears throat> and now, if it's true that rho can go to rho prime via a thermal operation, then we also know that this operation commutes with the dephasing map. Um, and then I can write out the relationship between the energy population of the final state, Tj prime, uh, in terms of some other things, okay? So first of all, we know that these are basically um, the diagonal elements of rho d prime which is essentially first applying the thermal operation to rho and then the phasing, but they commute. So I can swap them. Uh, if I swap them, then here, what I have is D of rho, which is essentially the defaced version of the initial state, right? So what I have here in the, in the end is the defaced version of the uh, initial state, um, and taking the J, uh, J's eigenvalue. So um, basically, at the end, what uh, I will see is that the, the final probabilities in uh, PJI, so the last step is basically to take rho D and take uh, the expression for rho D that we wrote out explicitly and substitute this in. Um, this gives us the summation. This gives us PI, which we pull out. And here we have this extra term, but what is this? This is taking the uh, thermal operation, acting it on this particular energy eigenstate EI, um, bringing it to some particular state and finding the probability that it, it's collapsed into EJ, right? So this is describing the classical action of the thermal operation, but on the, on the energy population, essentially. Um, and so we can describe this purely as a, a classical channel. Um, and uh, this has to be give stochastic if you have the, uh, if you have a subtle operation, this we know. Um, <clears throat> which means that uh, if oops, if this is give stochastic, then we know that thermal majorization has to hold. So thermal majorization becomes necessary on the deeper heat state, but it's no longer sufficient. Okay, so um, I already mentioned this, but essentially thermal majorization, which is the comparing of these curves, uh, implies immediately uh, a sort of irreversibility or some incomparability on the single shot level. Because if you think about two different states, um, you if you order them just with one monotone, which you recall is the thing that would give us reversibility, um, then, um, here, what, what we have is essentially that you can have, uh, if you have two states, and if you only have one monotone, then given any two states, there's always a way to order them. Either one is larger than the other, or this is larger than this, or they are equal, right? Um, so there's always a clear way to say that either one state can go to another, or vice versa, or they can be interchanged uh, if there's only one relevant monotone. But when you compare some majorization diagrams, you can have cases where one, uh, neither of them always lay on top of one another. So they cross each other 
And so biothermal thermal operations, you cannot go from row to row prime, and you also cannot go from row prime to row. Okay. Uh, if you extend this to many copies, it means that you will have to start out with n copies of row A. You will get a smaller number of row A prime. And when you now try to go to uh, go back to row A, you have to further decrease the number of copies. So you don't have to work with the anymore in this in this scenario. So the question is, how could we recover this reversibility? So the first step that uh, we saw in, in, in the literature was that you can circumvent some of this reversibility by adding uh, a catalyst. So there are sometimes when you add in an additional state uh, to both the initial and the final state by taking just tensor products, then sometimes you you can you there are some some major additions diagram cross here, but they don't cross here. So what you see is that now I can go from row A uh, tensor omega C to row prime A tensor omega C, and so I can keep the the catalyst is kind of used during this process, but then it stays in its original state and it can go off and it can activate some other reaction, and it can be reused, essentially. So that's kind of it. Um, but when we see that uh, if we had state transition conditions here, um, and once we moved here, some of them have to be relaxed. Okay. So the question is, what kind of monotones will be relaxed, and what kind of monotones will have to stay? That is the question that we would could think about figuring out. Okay. Any ideas on if we think about functions or monotones such as the free energy? Um, what what do what do quantities have to satisfy in order to kind of remain a monotone, even when you add on a catalyst like this? Maybe not super straightforward. So. I will, I, will, I will go straight straight to it. It's kind of nice because it's also the point where we start to see uh, why a mathematical intuition of the properties of monotones can really help us in understanding what happens when we try to enlarge our set of, uh, set of operations. So uh, the first observation, now if we have a monotone, which is a function acting on, on your system, if we know that it is a necessary monotone under thermal operations, meaning that it necessarily has to decrease whenever rho can go to sigma in, uh, in this uh, well, abuse of mutation sigma or rho prime, essentially. Um, <clears throat> and furthermore, if we do know that this function is additive under tensor product, which means that rho one tensor rho two is just simply uh, rho, uh, f of rho one plus f of F of row two, so many typos. <laughs> um, then F has to remain a monotone even when we allow for a catalyst. Okay, and obviously this type of condition of additivity under the tensor product reminds you about quantities that grow extensively with the with the size of your system. Right, you're taking number of co copies of systems, and if they're not correlated, then this thing just grows in terms of addition. So this is essentially what, what it means to be additive under tensor product. Um, and the proof is, of course, very simple, because if, uh, if there exists, does exist omega, that this is true under thermal operations, then, of course, f of rho tensor sigma on, on the joint system of uh, system of, of, and catalyst has to hold. But then I can uh, write this out as just the summation of both. Uh, on the left hand side and the right hand side, I have f of omega, which cancels, uh, which means that this monotonicity uh, just on the level of the system still has to remain true. Okay. Of course, there are plenty of additive functions in, in the world. Uh, the, the question is which of them are necessary monotones and also they have the property of being additive. So um, that, is, that is basically the intuition. And uh, essentially, this is something that leads to uh, the development of generalized free energies uh, as the necessary monotone when it comes to further allowing for catalysts to participate in your thermodynamic process. Okay. Um, what's 
more is that uh, so we will talk about the definitions of these this generalized free energies for a bit. But the first thing that is important about them is that they're additive. And the second thing that is important about them is that for the state where we are talking about energy incoherent states, then they are in fact the, 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 the complete set of monotones that we were looking for. Uh, essentially, they will characterize fully uh, catalytic versions of thermal operations. Okay, um, and you. So what you see here is that the uh, generalized free energies look almost like a free energy in a sense that they are also related to these D alpha quantities. Before that, we were talking about this being the quantum relative entropy, and here having the just the non-equilibrium free energy. Um, but here you now you see this curious little parameter alpha. Uh, which is a real value parameter that goes uh, uh, from zero to infinity, and this is uh, it is this goes into the parameterization of this d alpha quantity, um, which uh, is for for the the case where rho is incoherent, then it reduces to something called the classical Rémy divergences, something that mathematicians, cryptographers have been studying since I don't know forty or fifty years. Rennie. Since Rennie, yes. Um, so uh, Rennie, they have they in the forties, forties, right? So um, so Rennie did a lot of good work in this, and later on, these quantities were also recognized in cryptography as uh, ways to quantify higher moments, essentially, but in a way such that it's relevant for uh, cryptographic practices. Okay. Um, so what does this have to do with the, the original quantity of free energy that we we love, we have, we've grown to love? Now, um, we don't know these quantities, but the nice thing is that they do include the uh, relative entropy, the Kullback entropy that we have. In the particular case where we take alpha, this parameter uh, going to the limit of um, alpha, yes. going to alpha equals one, then this reduces to the uh, uh, relative entropy and gives us again the uh, standard non-equilibrium free energy that we were talking about uh, yesterday. Um, so the necessity of these uh, free energies being uh, monotones is easy to prove. Uh, this makes use of what information theorists call a data processing inequality. Um, and the fact that they are now they are additive monotones, these two put together, you get necessity of uh, uh, generalized free energies being monotonic. Mm. But sufficiency is a bit harder to prove. It relies heavily on some some black magic, uh, which I'm not going to talk about today. <laughs> okay. Um, questions here? No. Yes. Um, yeah. I actually never tried to go back to the rich bit catalyst. I mm -hmm. always like be fascinated by the idea of catalyst, but I have very little intuition mm -hmm. about you know how they work in flying like a fly model. Do you like if I were to build some some fly model where you know I sit behind my back for a couple of minutes? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it clear what kind of like Hamiltonians could generate a little interaction? Mm -hmm. like, no? Yes. So this is a problem that I've been thinking of uh, since the beginning of my PhD, and uh, I don't have an answer, to be honest. Like, I tried. <laughs> I tried many ways to kind of get an intuition of that. And in some sense, there are painfully little things that we can take in terms of intuition, right? So the, the main intuition is, for example, that omega c, in order for it to be useful here, um, doesn't, uh, should not be uh, a thermal thing. If it's a thermal state, it doesn't really count, which is intuitive because if it's a thermal state, it's already for free. So we can't imagine that it would be helpful. Um, for pure states, it's also not really helpful. So it has to be something that is in the middle, which has a, a good amount of mixedness, but not too much. Uh, that kind of helps with bypassing some of the higher moment constraints. And there are also not many results. Uh, okay, there are some results known in terms of the dimensionality. And the reason why this question is really so tough is that 
the actual uh, the actual construction of the catalyst itself is heavily dependent on the state trans transformation that you want, right? Uh, it essentially depends on rho and rho factor. So you will have to think about an explicit construction. And when when people studied this initially for like catalytic majorization, uh, the proof is constructed, but the proof is also a bit opaque. But uh, so it's not so easy. Um, and there are also some simple proofs that have shown that if you really want to reach uh, state transition, general state transition, then your catalyst in principle has to be uh, quite large. It, it has, it, it's not kept uh, in terms of dimension. Um, there are some lower bound norms on how large your catalyst needs to be. And one of the intuition is that the closer, for example, the free energies are, then the larger your catalyst has to be. Uh, those are the main things that are out, out there. Um, how are we with time? Um, how are we with time? I'm doing okay. Over 10 minutes? Okay. Okay. So, um, back to here. So in some sense, if we are content with energy in coherent state, then wonderful. Uh, even if we add a catalyst into the picture, we know how to characterize them. They are this set of generalized free energies. Once we check them, we have confidence that there exists a catalyst, there exists a bar, there exists an energy preserving operation over the entire thing, uh, such that uh, the transition is possible. Okay, uh, there have been complaints. First of all, this is a continuous family of uh, free energies. Not exactly what people like to hear. Um, but the good news is of course that we do know some very nice properties about the alpha in general. For example, uh, these quantities are monotonic in terms of alpha. <clears throat> so we can sometimes leverage on some of the things we know about the alpha, uh, such that the fact that the limits do exist uh, and that they have this kind of monotonic behavior with alpha, um, and we can use these things to kind of get a better handle on, on the, the characterizations. <laughs> so we can then use these properties to think about applying this uh, these generalized second laws to problems of work extraction. We have talked quite a bit about work, energy, what it means to kind of store work as useful energy. Um, and I think Nicole was, was the one who was talking about various different ways of quantifying uh, work in, in uh, quantum thermal. Uh, I used to make this old joke that uh, uh, if you go into a room with 10 thermodynamics, uh, quantum thermodynamics people, then they, they will come up with, let's say, 20 definitions of work. Um, but at this point, I think the field has kind of uh, largely agreed with, the, uh, let's say, uh, Nicole's statement of saying that just define it and use it consistently, and probably no one will yell at you, <laughs> is, is the, the general consensus. Okay. So, um, one particular way that is kind of popular in, uh, of quantifying work in Lucas theories is to say you tag on a battery. So you tag on an explicit system and you talk about um, the states of uh, the states that your battery can take and you quantify work as a function of the states of your the initial and final states of your battery. Okay, so we can take the most simple idealistic picture of being like you know, being like uh, fail proof or like safe and say that, okay, I do want it to be very ordered work. I don't want entropy in my battery. So I'm going to assume that uh, in principle, I want my battery to start out in some pure state, energy eigenstate. And at the end, I want to get uh, basically to another energy eigenstate. That's one way of thinking about it. Of course, you don't need to do this, but this is a particular way to do it. So if you now then apply the generalized free energies to the joint system of uh, system and battery and think about what is the largest energy difference that you, you can create here uh, while trying to extract work out of the system and storing it in a battery, okay? Then we can, once we apply these rules, 
we see that actually the work, uh, the extractable work doesn't depend on all the free energies because of the monotonicity property of, of the DR. In fact, there is one quantity that is important for this, and this is when alpha is equal to zero. Uh, this is also sometimes called the D min, min meaning that it is the minimum one of all of, of the, of the Rennie uh, divergences. And similarly, you can look at the reverse problem, which is that you maybe start out, oh, um, I think I probably do this badly, uh, but the idea was that here, you wanted to extract work, so you start out from an empty battery and go to a full one. Uh, and here, you are trying to create the state out of something that was originally free, so something that is thermal. And in the, that process, you use a full battery, something which, which is a high excited uh, pure energy eigen state, and you deplete it in the, in the process, uh, creating the system, uh, preparing the system that you want, and you ask what is, again, the minimum uh, energy cost that you have to put in. This type of characterization is pretty much the same uh, idea moved from entanglement to, uh, to this. But we talk about preparing entangled states. We also ask the question of how many uh, maximally uh, entangled bell states do we need in order to prepare a state via LGC? And if I try to kind of um, take a particular state and I want to distill entanglement out of it, how many maximally entangled bell states can I get to? So this is like bell states is like the golden bar quantity, like the currency for entanglement. And uh, we can think of pure energy eigenstates as well in terms of thermodynamics for, for this kind of uh, this kind of currency. Um, so in uh, the analysis for work cost of preparing a state, um, we see that uh, this is now a different quantity, which is the D infinity, sometimes called the D max. Max carrying the connotation that out of all the Rennie uh, divergences is the largest. So in general, this quantity is going to be larger than the extractable work, which means that catalysis, um, of course, is not going to be reversible because we saw this whole family of uh, free energies. And in particular for work extraction, um, the, the cost is not going to be the same as the amount of work you, you can extract, um, even when you allow for catalysis. So recall that for reversibility, we really need to be in a scenario where only one resource monotone is relevant. So we, so we kind of circumvent some of them by using the generalized free energies. But if we get here, if we want to get here, uh, what should we do? Take copies. The most, the most straightforward thing that we can do is to take copies. And once we take copies, what we do know is we have this, um, not only uh, the statement on the limit of many, many copies, what we do have is an understanding of how all of these generalized Rennie divergence converge as a function of n, the number of copies that we take. So um, then you can ask yourself the question, what if I have a reasonable amount of identical copies so you start off with row tensor n, and you want to reach a final state, which is epsilon close to rho prime tensor n. And so uh, this is an illustration taken from Cook that if you compare the D max and the D min quantity and allow for a small amount of error, and this small amount of error is super important, yeah, because otherwise, of course, these quantities are additive. So taking tensor products won't necessarily help. Uh, it's because precisely because of the small amount of error that you can allow here, such that when you take the large n limit, uh, both the d max and the d min epsilon versions of them will start to converge, and they will start to converge. So initially, the difference between these quantities and the and the standard uh, relative entropy is not symmetric, not necessarily. Once you re reach kind of an intermediate regime for n this gap between them starts to become symmetric. And then this gap also slowly vanishes in the limit of n going to infinity. And we know very kind of precise bounds as to how uh, these uh, convergence behavior is. 
And so this gives us uh, a condition uh, on uh, expression on the rate, which is really on the zeroth order of what we want. We we see that it's precisely the ratio of free energy, non equilibrium free energy, but with a small corrective factor that uh, goes away with one of the square root n. Uh, essentially, is central limit theorem kind of behavior. Um, and in the asymptotic limit, we get that reversibility. Happy? Kind of? <laughs> Yeah, well, not necessarily everyone is happy with this because um, large N is expensive, right? It's not necessarily a nice thing. Sure, we know we know all these results. For me, like, oh, they're so beautiful mathematically, I can play with them. But not necessarily everyone is happy with just taking the large N limit. Um, <clears throat> and this comes to another, uh, actually a second pathway to how you can actually get reversibility. And it relates to relaxing the condition on catalysis such that yeah, you are you allowed to bring in the catalyst initially that is in, uncorrelated with the system. But at the end, you still require that, although you still require that the catalyst has to remain um, the same, uh, the, the local reduced state has to be the same. But in fact, you can relax it by allowing some correlations to exist between the catalyst and the system. So this, this seems like a pretty innocent uh, 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 relaxation. And we can ask, well, we know that once you relax something like this, you will lose some monotones. Uh, the hope is that you lose enough of them. Yeah? Uh, and the question is then, what kind of properties of monotones are necessary to be retained uh, once you do the relaxation, okay? So the first thing that we realize is that now the additivity of monotone under tensor product doesn't really guarantee anything anymore. Because if we want to say, let's allow correlations and we have a, a, a rho tensor sigma going to rho prime tensor sigma, uh, uh, tensor omega, then uh, if, this is true via some operations. Then we know that uh, the alphas have to decrease, right? But here, you can't really separate the S component and the C component anymore. And so you can do this nice trick to, to cancel them both off. Um, in fact, you can only do that if you know further that this quantity of the alpha is also larger than uh, the uncorrelated version, right? Because if you know this, then you can say that the alpha of this is larger than this. And then now here you apply additivity and then you cancel. And you say that, voila, this has to remain a monotone. So if we know this, then this is a monotone. If we don't know it, then it's not so clear. Um, and this property here is called super additivity. And you can think about uh, this super additivity as uh, intuitively saying that in general, correlations are always more resourceful. Or in other words, you can always decorrelate for free. That's kind of the idea. Uh, and if we know, if we, if we use our mathematical intuition of you know, uh, building an order, all the people who have done the hard work in studying these properties for us, then we know that super additivity is not true in general of the alphas, uh, except for the case where alpha is equal to one. And so what was really done in this incredible uh, series of work by Miller and his uh, colleagues was that they showed, in fact, alpha equal one's condition is the only condition that remains. Uh, you lose the generalized free energy once you allow for arbitrary correlations to exist between your catalyst and the system. Of course, this is, this is non-trivial. There, there can be a, quite a, a large amount of correlations that are here, and the catalyst can also be large in principle. So it's maybe allowing for quite a bit, but once you really do have that, um, you only retain the uh, uh, equilibrium, non-equilibrium free energy. The, uh, the, the, given by the quantum relative entropy that we know. So this is uh, very much guided by our understanding of the quantum relative entropy 
being this nice property that satisfies data processing, it satisfies additivity on the tensor product. It also satisfies super additivity and it's uh, continuous when you take the limit of many copies as a topic. Um, and in fact, this, uh, the relative entropy is the only function that satisfies this uh, up to uh, additive multiplication. Okay. Um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, incredible kind of mathematical result, if I must say. I, I really like this, this characterization of the quantum entropy. Um, but now, what we, what we do have is that we're not taking many copies of the system. We're just saying that let me take one copy of the system, let me have the freedom to kind of design my catalyst, uh, and let me have the freedom to retain some correlations between the catalyst and system as long as the reduced state rem remains the same. Then, in fact, we can bypass all of the additional higher moment restrictions that were originally described by the alphas, and we are left with just the free energy. Okay. Um, I think this is probably a good time to end. Um, let's see if, yeah. So this is just the last slide that I'm going to show, which is that, of course, the problem of what happens when uh, row and row prime have some energetic coherence is again, we still have some more majorization as necessary. So the generalized free energies will become necessary, but they're not sufficient anymore. Um, the nice thing is that full characterizations for not thermal operations, but the enhanced versions of thermal operations. If you remember, that means the set of channels which are Gibbs preserving and time trans uh, translation covariant. Um, so we do know a full characterizations of enhanced thermal operations when it comes to state transitions. And these are for, uh, formalized as quantum generalizations of uh, thermal majorization. Um, <clears throat> and we, we know also what happens in the uh, asymptotic limit for the case of uh, arbitrary row and row prime. Okay, so this is a good point to, to stop. Uh, I already feel that it's incredible that I have your attention until this point. So thanks very much for listening and I will take questions. Questions can happen offline as well. Yeah, uh, without the event, join me thanking uh, Ali and all of the other lecturers today. Yeah. So, housekeeping apparently has brought extra house and uh, all the case of mittens or extra things coming over at the end. So, if you go to your casino, we charge the batteries for the bar. I cannot turn off Zoom now. <laughs> yeah, because I, ah, okay. I can see my screen now. Okay, stop sharing. I have a comment, I think. Yes. Helps some intuition. <laughs>